Good evening, church family, and welcome back to our Cloud of Witnesses study. I hope you're having a great week, and uh, I appreciate you tuning back in to continue our study focused on men and women of faith about whom we read in Scripture, uh, people who weren't perfect by any stretch of the imagination, but they persevered through life's hardships and struggles. They grew, they matured uh, in their faith, and they leave such a powerful example for us. Last week, we focused on John the Immerser, John the Baptizer, and in keeping that, that theme of focusing on those named John going, I wanted us tonight to talk about John, the son of Zebedee, and his brother James. And uh, when Jesus first called these two fishermen, they had a long way to go in understanding what the demands of discipleship were, understanding what the kingdom of God was all about, and yet they both become such powerful witnesses for Jesus to the point that James is going to become the first of the apostles to lose his life in the cause of Christ. John is going to be the last living apostle of those original 12, and uh, himself will suffer uh, for the cause of Christ being exiled to the island of Patmos, but even there, God's going to use him in a powerful way in receiving this revelation, this apocalypse, this uncovering of things that were to come and uh, blessing us with the encouraging message of revelation that, uh, yes, there is a war going on, but victory is assured. So tonight, let's focus on these two sons of Zebedee, and I want us to start by uh, reading together from Luke chapter 5, beginning in uh, verse 1. And as we, we think about James and John, we always find their names in that order, with the exception of, of only once in the Gospels. And why that is, I'm not exactly sure. It could be that James was the older of the two brothers, and uh, that would make sense to list them in the order of their birth, older brother and younger brother. Or it could be the fact that by the time the Gospels are written down, uh, James has already given his life in the cause of Christ. And this was a way of, of honoring him since John is still going to be very much alive during the time uh, that the Gospels are written uh, in the mid first century and living on nearly to the end of the first century. So uh, we'll be focusing on, on those two tonight. But in, in Luke 5, we have Luke's account of their calling to follow Jesus. We also have parallels in Matthew and Mark, to which we will be making some references. But just start reading with me in Luke chapter 5, verse 1. One day as Jesus was standing by the lake of Gennesaret, or the Sea of Galilee, the people were crowding around him and listening to the word of God. He saw at the water's edge two boats left there by the fishermen who were washing their nets. He got into one of the boats, the one belonging to Simon, and asked him to put out a little from shore. Then he sat down and taught the people from the boat. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out into deep water and let down the nets for a catch. Simon answered, Master, we've worked hard all night. We're tired. We haven't caught anything, but because you say so, even at this point, Simon Peter um, is willing to hold on to something that defies conventional wisdom, defies human experience as he has lived it, and simply because you say so, I'll let down the nets. When they had done so, they caught such a large number of fish that their nets began to break. So they signaled their partners, who were their partners, the partners of Simon and Andrew are James and John, the sons of Zebedee. They, they signaled their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both boats so full that they began to sink. When Simon Peter saw this, he fell at Jesus' knees and said, Go away from me, Lord, I am a sinful man. Even now, Peter recognizes, his, recognizes Jesus' holiness, uh, that this must be deity in human form, something totally otherworldly that just by comparison exposes his own weakness and his sinfulness. I'm a sinful man, for he and all his companions were astonished at the catch of fish they had taken, and so were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, Simon's partners. Jesus said to Simon, don't be afraid. 
from now on you will fish for people. So they pulled their boats up to the shore, left everything and followed him. Uh, you can understand why these four men who have spent their life on this body of water, they were fishermen as their fathers had been, as their grandfathers and great grandfathers likely had been, and they're overwhelmed, they're humbled, they're fearful, and Jesus says, you don't need to be afraid, uh, you're still going to be fishermen, but no longer for the fish of the lake of Gennesaret, you're going to be fishing for the souls of the men, uh, for the souls of men and women. And so James and John join Peter and Andrew in immediately leaving everything and following Jesus. That means they left their boats, they left their nets. Uh, for James and John, they leave their father, uh, they leave their past behind. And just imagine, you know, Jesus showing up at your place of work, coming to your office, coming to the production floor uh, where you work, coming to the school where you teach and saying, I've got a new calling for you. I've got a new mission for you. Leave everything and follow me. Don't even pack up your desk. Don't even get your supplies. Just follow me. Even at this point, while they've got a long way to go, that's a huge amount of faith that they demonstrate in Jesus. Uh, a lot of commitment that they demonstrate. Uh, for James and John, this means leaving Zebedee, their father. According to Mark chapter 1, verse 20, it also says, because they were in the boat with their father when Jesus called them, they left their father and their hired men. This wasn't just some little mom and pop fishing operation. Uh, this was something that not only provided their livelihood, it was in a, an enterprise that provided employment for other people. Uh, this could have been a fairly large, prominent, and influential enterprise that had been going for generations. We'll learn much later in the gospel story in John chapter 18, verse 15, that uh, John was acquainted with, he was known by the high priest. Now, how does a Galilean fisherman become known to the high and mighty and wealthy high priest in Jerusalem? Maybe because his own family is somewhat influential because of the success of their business. And all of that is left behind. This was a big decision. This was a huge commitment, a life altering decision. And it obviously isn't because they don't have anything else going on. It's not that James looks at John and says, you know, we've really got no plans. We've got no future. We have no prospect. Uh, we don't have a path laid out before us. So sure, why not? Let's follow Jesus. They sacrificed a lot, even at this point, to follow him. And this was a part of the cost of discipleship for them. And, and discipleship has a cost for us too. It may be different, likely is different, uh, but there will come times in our life of following Jesus when we're going to have to make a choice. And to maintain that fidelity to Jesus is, is going to mean that we have to lose something else. Maybe it's a, it's a relationship. Maybe it's a promotion in our employment because there are certain things we just won't do that you have to do in order to, to gain that promotion. Uh, that, that faithfulness to Jesus will ultimately be rewarded, even if it's not rewarded in this life. Um, Ultimately, there are going to be not just a few people, there are going to be multitudes, hundreds, thousands of people that in, uh, at some level or another follow Jesus. And from among all of those disciples, Jesus is going to identify a select few. He's going to choose a handful, a dozen, whom he will name as apostles. Uh, apostolos, just a, a word meaning one cent but these are going to be individuals sent with uh, special authority and special power. Uh, authority to preach and teach in the name of Jesus, promoting his message of repentance because of the nearness of the kingdom of God, and also power to heal all kinds of sicknesses and, sicknesses and diseases, power to cast out demons. Um, and so at, at the beginning, Peter and Andrew, James and John, these two sets of brothers, um, they're just among the disciples. 
And when you think about how few of those are going to be chosen as apostles, uh, what are the chances that a set of brothers are going to be chosen? Even two sets of brothers are going to be chosen. Can you imagine if John had been named an apostle and James had not? Or if Andrew had been named an apostle and Peter had not? Since these are human brothers, you can just imagine that there's some level of sibling rivalry there. There's some sort of competitive spirit that existed among them. I'm sure there would have been some very hurt feelings uh, had one of them been chosen and the brother had not. Uh, but like Peter and Andrew, both James and John are selected for this elite core of empowered disciples. Uh, again, what are the odds that two people from the same family would be chosen as apostles, and then that would happen twice. Uh, let's read from Mark chapter 3, as Mark uh, describes the, the, the naming of the 12 as apostles. This will be in Mark chapter 3, beginning in verse 13. Jesus went up on a mountainside and called to him those whom he wanted. Luke will tell us that before this happens, Jesus had spent the entire night, the previous night, uh, not sleeping, but an entire night in prayer to the Father before this world-changing decision was going to be made. Um, he called to him those he wanted, and they came to him. He appointed 12 that they might be with him and that he might send them out to preach and to have authority to drive out demons. These are the 12 he appointed. Simon, whom he gave the name Peter, um, James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John. And then parenthetically, Mark says, to them, or excuse me, um, yes, to them, he gave the name Boanerges, which means sons of thunder. Mark doesn't bother to tell us why he called them sons of thunder. But there's enough recorded in the Gospels that even though we are left somewhat to guess, uh, it's an educated guess that we can make based on a few incidences uh, involving James and John that are recorded for us in the Gospels. And uh, a couple of those are in Luke chapter 9, so I want you to turn there with me as well. Luke chapter 9, beginning in verse 49. Master, said John, this is John, the son of Zebedee, Master, we saw someone driving out demons in your name, and we tried to stop him because he is not one of us. Do not stop him, Jesus said, for whoever is not against you is for you. Uh, again, we're trying to maybe determine why these two brothers become nicknamed uh, by Jesus as Boanerges, Sons of Thunder, the Thunder Brothers, the Thunder Boys. Um, in this instance, John probably thinks that he's doing Jesus a favor, that he would be commended by Jesus in the sense that he was saying to him, Lord, I've got your back. Uh, we came across this guy and he's infringing on your copyright, and so we called him out on it, and we told him to stop, to cease and desist. And why they did this, I'm not entirely sure. Part of it could have been embarrassment. One of the things that we read about earlier in Luke chapter 9, beginning in verse 37, is the failure of the disciples of Jesus to be able to cast out a demon, uh, a demon from the, the tormented son of a devoted, loving father. And when the disciples can't cast the demon out of his son, uh, he comes to, this man comes to Jesus for help on his son's behalf. And that had to be somewhat um, challenging and embarrassing to the apostles uh, that they couldn't do that. And now here is someone, the, the text doesn't say that they had come across a man who was attempting to cast out demons in the name of Jesus. He was someone who was driving them out. Not like the seven sons of Sceva about whom we read in uh, the book of Acts, who uh, had no faith in Jesus Christ and we're just trying to cast out demons in the name of Jesus whom Paul preaches, you know the disastrous result there. The implication seems to be that demons were being cast out by this man in the name of Jesus. And why was it that he could do that? 
and the apostles had just failed. So maybe some of it is, is hurt pride that causes John to do this. And Jesus's response is, that wasn't the right call, John. Don't hinder them. Don't hinder him. Um, and verse 50, do not stop him, Jesus said, for whoever is, is not against you is for you. The parallel to this in Mark's gospel is found in Mark chapter 9, verses 39 and 40. And listen to what Mark describes as Jesus's response to John. Do not hinder him, for there is no one who will perform a miracle in my name and be uh, be able soon afterward to speak evil me evil of me for he who is not against us is for us um, he's not doing us any harm he's not working against us he believes in me he believes there's power in my name and he's using that to cast out these demons there, there's an old testament parallel to this protest uh, that appears in numbers chapter 11 in Numbers 11, Moses has complained to the Lord about the complaints of the people. Uh, the people have been given manna to eat, uh, but they are starving to death now for meat. And they have this totally wrong-headed notion of, of missing Egypt. Ah, oh, remember the meat that we had in Egypt and the melons and the leeks and the cucumbers and all these, these other uh, foods that, that we used to enjoy. And Moses says, I can't take this anymore. Um, he basically says to the Lord, I'm not their mother. He says, I didn't conceive these people. I didn't give birth to these people. I can't carry them through the wilderness. So God says, well, get 70 elders and from among the people, and I will take from the portion of the, my spirit that I've put on you, and I will disperse that. I will spread that out among these 70, and they will help you bear this burden. Have them come to the tent of meeting, to the tabernacle, to meet with you there and meet with me there. Well, they do, at least 60. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> at least 68 of those elders do, and the Spirit descends upon them, and they prophesy they're at the tabernacle, but they only prophesy that once. Well, there were a couple of men, Eldad and Medad, who didn't make it out of the camp uh, from, from their tents out in the camp uh, into the middle where the, the tent of meeting was. But still, the Spirit fell on them out in the, uh, in the camp of Israel, and they prophesied too. And this alarms Joshua, uh, Moses' long-time uh, aide and assistant. And in Numbers uh, 11, 26 through 39, Joshua says, Moses, my Lord, in regard to the fact that Eldad and, and Medad were prophesying, Moses, my Lord, restrain them. And Moses' response was, are you jealous for my sake? Do you want them stopped because you think that that hurts my feelings or hurts my pride? Would that all of God's people were prophets, that the Lord would put his spirit uh, upon them all and how blessed we are to have God's Spirit upon us. But uh, Joshua assumed that he was being protective of Moses, but, but in essence, he was standing in the way of the work of God and the work of the Spirit. And the same seems to be in the, the case here with John. Um, John wasn't protecting Jesus from an unlicensed vendor of divine power as much as he was protecting his own feelings and ego as this partisan apostle. Um, in John's mind, this man didn't have the right pedigree. He didn't run with the right crowd. So John and the others were angered and foolishly interfered in the battle between good and evil. Uh, they interfered between the power of God and the power of Satan. And in a sense, Jesus says to John, stay in your lane, bro. Uh, stay in your lane, John. Don't get in the way of people who are doing good in my name. And that's a powerful lesson for us as well. I think there's a lesson for us in that as well. Well, continuing to read there in Luke chapter 9, verse 51, as the time approached for him to be taken up to heaven, Jesus resolutely set out for Jerusalem. And literally in the text, he set his face toward Jerusalem. And I regret that some of our newer translations don't reflect the literalness of that. Uh, yes, it is an idiom that means 
to, to be determined, but I love the visual imagery of setting your face toward Jerusalem. He got radar lock on it, uh, laser lock, and he wasn't going to be deterred from what awaited him in Jerusalem. Uh, so to travel from Galilee to Jerusalem, you have to go through Samaria. Verse 52, and he sent messengers on ahead who went into a Samaritan village to get things ready for him, but the people there did not welcome him because he was headed for Jerusalem. And you remember that history of animosity between the Jews and, and Samaritans. Uh, when the disciples, James and John, saw this, they asked, Lord, do you want us to call down fire from heaven to destroy them? But Jesus turned and rebuked them. Then he and his disciples went to another vi uh, village. Uh, given the, that history of animosity, centuries of animosity and hatred between Samaritans and, Samaritans and Jews, uh, the rejection of Jesus and the refusal to welcome Jesus and his disciples is not terribly uh, surprising to us. It's kind of what we would expect. What is surprising is the reaction of the Thunder Boys, Zebedee's sons. Um, where did that spirit come from? H had they not heard the Sermon on the Mount? Were they not listening that day? Were they not paying attention? Did they not take any notes? Uh, did they think Jesus was just talking about lofty intellectual ideas that had no relevance to everyday life in regard toward people who would consider themselves our enemies? And so this response, Lord, do you want us to call down fire from heaven uh, to consume them? I don't know what made them think that they could do that, but anyway, they, they wanted to at least get Jesus's permission before attempt, attempting it. This is reminiscent of something that the prophet Elijah did uh, in 2 Kings chapter 1. He calls down fire from heaven to consume these people. And um, it another thing that we read about a little earlier in the same chapter is the transfiguration of Jesus. Uh, where Peter and James and John were present, and Moses and Elijah appeared. And maybe Moses and Elijah are just weighing on their hearts at this time, weighing on their minds. And uh, Lord, do you want us to do what Elijah did? Jesus doesn't rebuke the Samaritans. He, he doesn't go off on a rant about the Samaritans and their refusal to receive him. However, he does rebuke James and John. And if you're reading from the King James Version or the New King James Version, you may have um, some words there from Jesus that don't appear in the New American Standard or the English Standard or the, the New International Version or the Holman Christian Standard Bible or other translations uh, that, that uh, you may be using. Um, simply because those words don't appear in the best manuscripts, but from some of those inferior manuscripts, they came uh, to, to appear in the King James Version, in which after it says that Jesus rebuked them, it says that he said to them, you don't know what kind of spirit you are of, for the Son of Man did not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. Again, that's not reflected in the best manuscripts that are now available to us, early Greek manuscripts of uh, the Gospel of Luke. However, those words do reflect uh, words that, that do appear elsewhere in the Gospel, uh, in the Gospels, particularly John chapter 3, verse 17. Uh, after saying in verse 16 that God loved the world so much that he sent his only begotten Son that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Verse 17 says that God didn't send his son into, into the world to condemn the world or to destroy the world, but that the world through him might be saved. And James and John are trying to wrap their brains around the fact that Jesus could respond to evil with good, that he could respond to cursing with blessing. And that's what they're being called to do. Ultimately, they will get there. Ultimately, uh, the son of thunder, one of the sons of thunder will become the apostle of love. But it's, it's a journey. It's quite a long journey for him. And then there's this desire for places of prominence. Uh, we'll read Mark's account of that in Mark chapter 10, 
beginning in verse 35. Mark 10, 35. Then James and John, the sons of Zebedee, were always reminded who their dad is. James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came to him. Teacher, they said, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. What do you want me to do for you, Jesus asked. They replied, let one of us sit at your right and the other at your left in your glory. You don't know what you're asking, Jesus said. Can you drink the cup I drink or be baptized with the baptism I am baptized with? We can, they answered. Jesus said to them, you will drink the cup I drink and be baptized with the baptism I am baptized with, but to sit at my right or left is not for me to grant. These places belong to those for whom they have been prepared, in Matthew's account, those for whom they have been prepared by my Father. When you compare Matthew's account to what we just read from Mark chapter 10, um, Matthew says that they actually get their mother to make this request of, of Jesus, and you have to at least give their mother and, and them credit for their lack of timidity, for their willingness to be somewhat brash and bold. Uh, they truly do thunder up on this one. Uh, this is a big ask, uh, stepping up to the plate. They're, they're not trying to lay down a bunt. They're, they're swinging for the fence with this request. And they're basically asking God in the flesh for a blank check. And Jesus responds to them much like we respond to people when they ask us, uh, would you promise me something? Or will you do me a favor? Well, that depends. What is it? Uh, what, what do you want me to do? What do you want me to promise? And so Jesus asked, tell me what you have in mind. And, oh, not, not much. Just grant that one of us can sit on your right and one of us in your le on your left uh, in your glory, uh, according to Matthew, in your kingdom. And remember who's asking. These are brothers, James and John. And don't think that it didn't matter uh, to them, which one of them got to be on the right and which one of them got to be on the left. I doubt that either uh, would have been just, just fine with them. Because again, I think there's probably this sibling rivalry, this competitive spirit between them, like exists in most, most other sets of siblings, uh, whether brothers or sisters. And um, again, though, in addition to commending them for their boldness and their willingness to ask big, I think we also need to acknowledge that both they and their mother had a full grasp of something. Even though there were details that were still muddled, they accepted that Jesus was indeed God's anointed one. This was indeed the Messiah, they, the, the king. They believed that God's kingdom was about to be ushered in. They believed that, they accepted it, and they wanted in on it. Uh, and they had enough faith to ask. Mrs. Zebedee just wanted uh, the, the best for her boys, like most of us parents want the best for our children. She was just a mom being a mom. But Jesus says, you know, I, I admire your boldness in asking, but you don't understand what you're asking. You don't understand the nature of my kingdom. It's not about position. It's not about power. It's not about authority. It's about service. It's about sacrifice. And what you don't know is that you have requested the, the positions of last and next to last. If you have in mind that you want to be uh, the, ne the, the greatest and the next to greatest, you've yet to, to fully comprehend that that's going to involve being willing to be last and next to last. They would share his cup of suffering. They would share his baptism of tribulation and trial. Again, James is ultimately going to be beheaded by Herod Agrippa I, as we read in Acts chapter 12. John is going to be exiled for his faith. But they didn't understand what Jesus' kingdom was, was about. We read that uh, in, in Matthew's account that when, when the ten heard about this, uh, they became indignant. Well, even here in Mark chapter 10, verse 41, when the 10 heard about this, they became indignant with James and John. Uh, they were really upset. They were angered, not because they understood the true nature of God's kingdom. They were probably just miffed because James and John got to the question before they did. I think all of them struggled 
uh, with this desire for preeminence because um, back in that same chapter, Luke chapter nine, came that discussion among them as to which one of them was the greatest. Jesus's response is, it's, it's not gonna be that way among you, not like it is among the power structures of this world, among the nations, among the power brokers. Leadership and greatness in this kingdom is going to be from the ground up, literally from the ground up. Those who are willing to get on their hands and knees on the ground and serve other people to wash their feet and meet whatever other needs they may have. And then even as apostles, James and John are first of all privileged to be a part of this chosen few, these, the, 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 this chosen 12, but within that number, James and John comprise two thirds of the big three, what, what are sometimes referred to as the, the inner circle of Jesus's apostles, James and John along with Peter. Those three alone are allowed to accompany Jesus into the room where he raises Jairus' daughter from the dead. Those three alone accompany Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration. And then Moses and Elijah appear and they, they see the, the uh, fleshly envelope peeled back uh, somewhat from Jesus so that his true glory is revealed and he's transfigured, he's metamorphosized before them. Uh, he tells them not to tell anyone about it until after he's been raised from the dead, and they don't even understand what that means yet. But ultimately, they are able to share, they are able to write about what happened on that mountain. Again, as you remember, those three accompany Jesus further into the inner recesses of the Garden of Gethsemane on the night of his betrayal. And um, Peter, James, and John, and Andrew, uh, are those that sit with Jesus on the Mount of Olives, looking back over the city of Jerusalem as he talks to them about the ultimate destruction of that city. And um, they are among the, the few that are in the house when Jesus uh, heals Peter's mother-in-law from her fever. So James and John, even within this group of 12 apostles, are, are privileged to be in this inner circle. John even more so as he will be referred to uh, within the gospel that he writes, he'll refer to himself as the disciple whom Jesus loved. Um, and in the book of Acts, John is going to accompany Peter in a, in a strong role of, of leadership in the early Jerusalem church. Uh, we read about them extensively in, in Acts chapter three and four and five. They are imprisoned, they are threatened, they are beaten, and they still keep proclaiming the name of Jesus as the only name of salvation. In Acts chapter 8, Peter and John travel together up to Samaria so that they can lay hands on those men and women who had been baptized uh, into Jesus Christ so that they might receive miraculous measures of the Spirit in addition to the, the gift of the indwelling Spirit that they had, uh, they had received. So I, I think what we read about James and John in the rest of the story, especially as Luke writes it, part two of Luke Acts, I think we begin to see why Jesus chose James and John to be among his apostles and to go ahead and grant them power and authority during his earthly ministry. It wasn't because of who they were at the time but because of who they could become through the transformational power of Jesus. He saw their potential rather than judging them entirely based on their present attitudes and behavior. And again, I think that's a, a call to us, a lesson to us, uh, a warning to us not to be quick and not to be so dismissive of people, to write them off as a lost cause or as being too far gone, that, that because of choices that, that they have made in the past, or even maybe currently continuing to make, uh, that somehow they're unteachable, they are unreachable, they are irreconcilable to God, that that status simply doesn't exist as long as there is life, as long as there is hope. 
And so we need to try to see Jesus, uh, we need to try to see people as Jesus saw them, not in their present reality, but what they can become through his transforming power. Jesus wasn't through with them yet. And uh, it was that potential that allowed John to become that disciple whom Jesus loved and ultimately the disciple of love. He's the one who's going to ultimately write first and second and third John and to be the one who pins uh, the apocalypse, the, uh, the revelation. How John mellowed in the years ahead uh, to where there is such tenderness and compassion and love. And that came partially because of age and maturity partially be because experience will sometimes do that to you, but mostly because that's what God can do to you. That's how God can transform someone from being uh, gruff to being gracious, from being a sore head to being one who is greatly sensitive to the needs of other people, uh, one who is so militant uh, to someone who extends mercy freely to other people. And when we, we think about James's martyrdom, when we think about him being put to death by the sword by Herod, which means he was beheaded, I, I don't see him going to his death as a son of thunder, breathing out condemnation to his executioners, threatening divine rep retribution, calling down a curse of fire from heaven upon them and upon their heads, but rather uh, one who had a calm and peaceful spirit one who had grace on his lips, who prayed for his persecutors and his executioners as Jesus did, and as Stephen had done a few chapters earlier in Acts. Um, I think Jesus saw in John a person who could become so tender and compassionate. That's who you want to entrust the care of your mother to uh, as, as you are dying, and that's what Jesus does from the cross with John. Uh, John continued on living as a living sacrifice for many more decades than, than his brother did, maybe close to 50 years longer. And, and imagine how close James and John must have been as brothers, growing up together, working together into their uh, early adulthood, and then losing your brother like that. I, I know those of you who have lost siblings know how that um, hurts your heart. It, it can crush your spirit. You miss them. Uh, for close to 50 years, John had to miss his brother in the flesh who was put to death. And, and yet he continues as a living sacrifice for many more decades, almost to the turn of a new century. And again, is traditionally thought to have been the last uh, living original apostle. And so one of the things I love in looking at the, what we know of James and John from scripture is that these sons of thunder are transformed into sons of the kingdom, uh, sons of their heavenly father, servants of the savior. And God can do the, the same in our lives as well. And uh, I'm grateful that, that we continue to have opportunities to grow, to mature, to develop into the kind of sons and daughters that God knows that we can be. Thanks again so much for being a part of the study tonight. I hope you have a great rest of the week, and we look forward to seeing all of you on Sunday morning at 10 o'clock, either live and in person in the um, auditorium or live through the live stream uh, on our YouTube channel. God bless you all, and have a wonderful evening.